Hi, my name's Rich and we are Consumer Hub and this is the FMCG podcast and this is the show where we talk with the leaders of today and hear their insights into what's going on in the categories that they specialise in and also how you can develop as a leader. So today we've got Charlie Johnson on the show from Pippin Nut. We're really excited to have Charlie with us because she's done some amazing work uh, in the malts, both on the buying side with a major retailer and also now moving through the supply base from Blue Ship into Pippin Nut, which is a very, very exciting uh, nut butter concept that you'll see all over the place in Tesco's at the moment, which we'll come on to later. So Charlie, thank you so much for coming on to the show. It's really great to have you here. Could you just give us a quick run through, quick overview over you, your career, and also what you're up to at Pippin Nut at the moment? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm Charlie. I um, started off my career in FMCG, I guess, uh, at Tesco on the grad scheme. So I had three buying roles at Tesco. Um, started off buying chilled vegetables, so basically anything green. Um, spent my life kind of in fields picking broccoli. I think I remember picking cauliflower at four in the morning for Christmas one nice. year, which was <laughs> yeah super interesting. Learned um, a lot about kind of agronomy and seasonality, um, which was yeah fascinating. Then I moved into a very different role at Tesco. I did a buying role in impulse category and I bought cereal bars and chocolate biscuit bars. So Kit Kats, um, et cetera, which was yeah worlds apart from, from the role at uh, in vegetables but that was also really exciting working with some big brands and some small startups then i moved into the frozen category um I was buying frozen chips frozen veg also very different and then yeah moved over to Grays, uh which was as an account manager so worked across a few different accounts there I was there for a few years and now i'm at pippin nut so I joined <clears throat> pippin nut in february last year so been here just over a year uh, and I look across, I look after the grocery customers. So yeah, all grocery customers. Um, and yeah, I'm a senior account manager. And it's great. Oh, cool. No, that's, uh, that's really interesting that uh, you've gone from, yeah, buying, uh, yeah, chill, chill veg, picking those cauliflowers early in the morning through yeah. to, uh, <laughs> to ambient snacks. What, um, yeah, what, what was the most interesting uh, veg that you sold or bought? It was really exciting being part of the category when everyone was sort of making smoothies with spinach and kale, and oh, yeah. that was really exciting. Um, I remember what I remember watching them harvest spinach and yeah. didn't know how spinach was grown, and it's wild. There's just fields, almost like a lawn of spinach, mm. and there's this inc- incredible machinery that just like hoovers it up from Crazy. the ground. So yeah, I mean. I did not expect to see myself doing that, but it was, yeah, it was fascinating. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. Like, I remember it's about five or six years ago, I went through a smoothie mad phase. It's like everything was smoothie. And I yeah. got this neutral bullet for Christmas and it's definitely gathering dust now, which might have like something to do with the fact that I've got a young family, but also I think I've just moved on to other 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 phases. Yeah. <laughs> My definitely. Nutrition no, it's, it's super interesting though. It's a cool category. Uh, that's, that's the exciting thing I've found about working in FMCs is there's so many trends coming through all the time and just endlessly mm. interesting. You never, never get bored, do you? Um, no. But just moving on to kind of where you are at the moment, like, what's it like um, sort of being in a in a SNAM um, in in a team of 30, in a, like a tight-knit team? Like, how, what, what's Just give us a bit of an insight into that world and, and what your day-to-day looks like. Yeah, um, so there's actually only 23 of us. So okay. it's a really, really small team. Um, and I guess in the sales team, there is five of us, including including our sales director. So wow. we are a really small, small team. Um, but it definitely doesn't feel like we're a team of five in sales. It feels like we're just one big team of 23 at Pippin right. Night. It's brilliant. It's very like open. Um, there's not much of a hierarchy. Uh, Pip herself is also really, really close to the business, which is, which is brilliant. Um, and yeah, there's not much kind of hierarchy between different levels, which I really, really respect. Um, there's lots of easy access to people and information because you work so closely with every other function. It's mm. yeah, the, the flow of information is brilliant. And you do get a real insight into the different functions and how everything works. And you get a, a real visibility of how your role in sales slots into the bigger picture, which I really enjoy, um, which is something you didn't necessarily get at, at a bigger company. Um, so yeah, it's great. I mean, the pace is wild. Uh, it's yeah, it's so fast paced, like any SME and everyone kind of mucks in a bit and just gets on with it. But yeah, it's brilliant. Brilliant. And it kind of like day to day, kind of what, what are you doing and, and kind of how does it compare or contrast to what you're doing in a bigger company? Uh, I guess the difference with my role here to previously is I look after a lot more customers. So previously I was focused on one or two big customers, whereas here all of my customers are pretty big and need quite a lot of focus. So Mm. I find that 
I have to almost get myself into my, I'm in my Tesco day or I'm in my Sainsbury's day or whatever to try and make yourself really um, slot into their strategy and think about their strategy in that day. It's quite hard to flip between the two. Okay, yeah. No two days are the same, but we do, the role of sales is quite cyclical in the sense that we have, you know, trading meetings in the week. We have meetings with our operations team. We have meetings with marketing and project teams. So every day is different, but the weeks are structured in a very similar way, but it's, most of the role is about speaking to our customers, I suppose, and just making mm. sure that you keep that relationship there. Um, so I'd say that's what I spend most of my time doing is just responding to customer requests, going back to customers, building presentations to send to customers, um, preparing for meetings. Um, yeah. That's really interesting. No, thanks for sharing. And it's interesting as well as an insight for me that, yeah, you're kind of using that chunking technique to, you know, make sure you double down on a particular you know, task and mm. customer on a particular slot because that's that's definitely a theme in the, the podcast that we're running kind of um, yeah, insights and advice from, from leaders is kind of make sure that you uh, kind of completely commit to a focus, even if it's just for half an hour. Because um, yeah. I mean, if I'm terrible, like naturally I just have my head all over the shop. So I have to like, be really yeah. disciplined. And sometimes I'm there with my AirPods and everyone thinks I'm being rude. It's just like, if I don't do this three hour slab of this now, it's not going to happen. Yeah. We have a really good structure actually. At, um, we <clears throat> introduced this thing called the weekly flow at Pip and Nut, where oh, yeah. we have um, the same types of meetings at the same on the same day. So, for example, yeah. um, Wednesdays are one to ones only, or uh, so everyone's in the set doing the same thing at one, at one time. And then the Wednesday mornings we have what we call monk mornings, which are no meetings, and right. it's a real opportunity for everyone to do exactly that: put the headphones in. Yeah. get the head down get stuck into a piece of work and so is that is monk, really monk mornings because you're kind of like you know isolated in your cell is that the idea or i think i th i think so i'm not 100 percent sure where the term came it's cool, from it's but cool term. yeah it's really good because there's been some study that says it takes the average person about 25 minutes to get stuck into a task so if mm. you're only allowing yourself an hour in between meetings to do something you've got 25 minutes to get stuck into it probably work on it for 20 minutes and then before you know it you've got to get yourself prepared for the meeting you're going to so you don't really have much time to get stuck into a task so actually having a full morning which we have on Wednesdays and Fridays with no meetings is brilliant because you can just you can fully attack something um yeah. so yeah it, it's really good it works really well I love that yeah we we've always like, developed a similar thing here actually we do every Wednesdays is, is content and marketing and any kind of like matters of business that relate to like strategy and big picture stuff uh, mm -hmm. and then Fridays everyone works from home and the idea is that everyone just like ties up all the loose ends and because recruitment is one of the things you've got like loads of critical paths and like everyone everyone's like number one critics and recruiters they're crap at admin and communication so we make sure like absolutely everything's bottomed out on Friday and, and yeah. then if we do that we'll get to you know finish on, on time which, which is good yeah. but um yeah we, that's just like evolved but um that, again that's been a thing that's come through is like yeah successful startups that are like punching punching hard and doing a lot mm. and, and sweating it um they, they, they kind of maximize the focus which I just find fascinating how, how does that kind of yeah. startup culture and the environment you're in at the moment compare to being in a bigger company that's more established like Gray's um, yeah, it's, it's different. I think you, it's really, really fast paced and like almost frighteningly so, but in a really great way, because it also means that you can get things done a lot quicker. You're way more agile. Um, you're way more kind of prepared to change and prepared to sort of adjust the project in the flow and, and, and kind of change the direction of something. Um, it feels like there's much more feedback and flow of information between teams. So I feel very much like my role now is kind of the voice of the retailer internally. And yeah, yeah. it's just as important for me to relay information to the team that I've had from the retailer as it is from for me to relay kind of information that we are, we want to deliver to a retailer, if that makes sense. So if a retailer was to feedback on a project and they didn't like, I don't know, for example, a what, what the product name was called or something or they didn't like they wanted a particular call out on pack that sort of information is something that we can genuinely feed back into a project because it's way more agile and, and fast paced so yeah that's that's really good it's also because you're a much smaller team you do get much more of an insight into every function and, and as I said before getting visibility of how your role slots into the bigger picture is great so knowing that 
how my role fits in with the supply chain team and what's important in my role to deliver to help them do their job. Yeah. Likewise with marketing, that sort of visibility um, or I guess closeness with the way you work, you just, you don't get that at such a bigger business. So it wasn't quite the same at Grey's. It felt a lot more like the teams were quite siloed um, and, and definitely at Tesco. I mean, I remember at Tesco, if you needed to speak to someone in finance, it was right send an email to the finance mailbox if that wasn't any we didn't get any luck with that then wander over to the finance building and see if you can find someone yeah. whereas here i can just shout over the desk probably quite rudely to someone in finance team and i get an answer in five minutes so it's it's like yeah you can get things done a lot more quickly um and you just you just work much closely together it's really good Oh, that's very really interesting. Okay, no, that's great insight. And what, what about going from um, yeah, buying side to uh, to, to supplier side? And did, did you feel like you were kind of you know uh, your game t- keeper turned poacher, or was it not quite 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 like that? <laughs> um, you do definitely. It's not as different as it's not as different as, as I first thought. To be honest with you, it wasn't as much of an adjustment. I think I remember the first thing I was really shocked at how much work you had to do Mm because I remember when I was a buyer and I would have account managers that were that what you know the Tesco account manager and I would just want I would just used to think I wonder what they do with their day like they can't have that I don't give them any work to do so they can't have that much work to do in their day and then coming this side you really realize like the volume of work and how much is how much you're kind of we use the term squirreling here how much you're squirreling away in the background to actually like deliver something for them so yeah and it it made me realize I had quite a lot of kind of retrospective guilt as a buyer because I realized a lot of the things or requests that I used to put in as a buyer actually what impact that can have on a business particularly a smaller business like Mm. that so um so yeah that was that was quite interesting but it's it's an easier adjustment in terms of the actual work you're doing because you're talking the same language you're still you're both and what you should be you know, both buyers and suppliers should be on the same agenda. You're both trying to grow sales, grow margin. It's, you're working, you should be working collaboratively to, to the same end goal. And ultimately you should be looking to sell a product that is best for the consumer. So you're both talking the same thing. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it wasn't actually as, as different, but I remember the first time I had a meeting with, with a buyer as a supplier, it was really funny because we'd been on obviously the same negotiation training. So <laughs> you can hear people, you'd hear sort of uh, responses to questions that were very sort of clear tactics. Mm. Um, so I found it quite easy in a way to, to just recognize those and learn how to respond to them, which, yeah, which was pretty good. Um, I guess the one, the biggest challenge though with moving is the shift of power and yeah. how, I, as a buyer, rightly or wrongly, had pretty much all the power in that relationship. And particularly, I think, if you are working for a, a retailer the size of Tesco, you yeah, you do have a lot of, of power. You have the upper hand. So moving to the supply side and that, that shift of power um, was quite challenging to start with. But, yeah, not as much of an adjustment as you'd first think. That's really interesting. No, that's, that's mm. very insightful. What, what about, um, there's some, you touched on the challenges there, which is really in, insightful, but what, what have been some of the biggest rewards moving to the supplier side? Um, I'd say that I, I always love coming up with ideas and thinking of, like thinking outside the box and weird and wacky ideas. And I think being as a buyer side, your role is very strictly commercial and you're buying as good and as best as you can in terms of generating the most money for the business and whatever so um it's not really your role to have ideas whereas i think moving this side and having an idea about how you can deliver a better product is actually listened to so that i found that really really rewarding definitely way more open to open to ideas um i think also if you work for a brand that you're passionate about, which I am, I love peanut butter and I love Pippin Nut before I joined here. So you feel really motivated by it. Um, mm. So I feel really, I'm really aligned to the values and the strategy that Pippin Nut have. And I truly want to deliver against that. And I think that feels really, really motivating and rewarding. And you also, 
it also helps I think when you're having conversations with buyers because you have that integrity and I think that is something that can be really really easily seen through so I think it just helps in the day job anyway being true living living and breathing the values of the company you work for um yeah brand days and meetings and stuff feel a lot more exciting because you're selling something you really love yeah. um and you get lots of free samples so I get peanut butter on tap now which is yeah which is a benefit <laughs> that, that is definitely a benefit in my book that's great yeah um and and I mean something that um, I just wanted to touch on is obviously you've had a massive win, uh, like real success with uh, opening up Tesco's for for Pip and Nut. So am I, am I right? I've got the figures right. Is it distributed in seven hundred and forty five stores now? Yeah, That's yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, that must be a massive uh, like home run for you. Like, how did it feel getting that away? Yeah, no, that was that was super exciting. So we have we already had a range, a small range in Tesco, um, but we got two of our core peanut butter. SKUs listed in 745 stores, um, yeah. which was, yeah, it's it's so exciting. It did make me realise when I was at Tesco how, when you can deliver positive news like that to a supplier, how truly like monumental that can be mm. to their business. And so it was really nice to be on this side and kind of on the receiving end of that. Um, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't easy like by any stretch of the imagination. It was it was a long time coming. I think I've only been at Pepper Nut for a year and. I know that the conversations were happening way before I joined. So it's not, yeah, definitely not fully on me. Um, and it took a lot of determination. I think it's just persevering with it, um, being quite resilient when you get sort of knockbacks or no's, um, which we've had a lot of the no's in the past. And yeah. yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a quick thing. So yeah, it was, it was exciting, but almost a bit of a, sigh of relief when it happened because yeah. it'd be a long time coming <laughs> like, like, like you just finished a big a big 10k yeah exactly <laughs> so that I mean, that's really interesting that feeds into my next question really which is like what does it take to win in the top four as a startup because you do see a lot of startups kind of rise and fall come and go mm. um sometimes they they do a bit with the malts and they don't quite nail it or they'll just end up going to a different distribution model or just focus on food service but there's other companies that seem to really like just nail opening up the malts as a channel. What, what do you think it takes to win in the malts as a, um, a smaller supplier coming through? Um, I think I think winning with one of the big four is just about, just as much about listening to your buyers or the retailers as it is about selling to them. So making sure that you are so in tune with their strategy, their priorities in the category, what's working well for them at the moment, what's not. Um, just really listening to what they have to say so that you can truly identify identify the gap that you can fill and perhaps identify the products that you can fill it with or identify the way that you can sell your products in so mm. help like navigate your conversation so that they can truly tap into that that need or that want of the buyer so just listening and being so aware of what their needs are because you can have the most brilliant product it can taste delicious you can be so you can so believe in the product you're selling, but ultimately, if it doesn't satisfy a need in that category, then it's not going to land on the shelves, particularly in one of the big four, because there is so much volume at stake, mm. and they're taking a big gamble on you. Um, so yeah, just stay tuned into all of the strategy updates, go to all of the conferences, what ask loads and loads and loads of questions whenever you have a meeting with someone, and just get all the information that you can. Um, but also the job isn't over when the product lands on the shelf. So just as quickly as you can get a listing and in 12 weeks time, it goes on the shelf, you can just as quickly be taken off. So remembering that celebrate the success when it lands, that's great. But also there is still so much work to be done afterwards, after it's landed to make sure that it sells well. So over investing in media, putting lots of activation behind it, shouting about it, talking about it to your friends. I think on that Tesco the job isn't done just with Tesco so if you if you or with a big retailer if you put so much focus on that one big retailer you will lose focus of the rest of your uh, customers or the rest of your distribution and I think it's really important to make sure that you're still nurturing where you are selling so that you have a really good sell story for those big four because otherwise if you lose sight of that you could just kind of I don't know slip away a bit so mm -hmm you need to almost make yourself irresistible to the big four by making, having a really good case study um, 
behind you so yeah don't lose focus elsewhere and yeah make yourself kind of irresistible to tesco and then i guess you're on, on to a win but okay ultimately oh, really interesting yeah it just needs to set it needs you need to identify the proper category need for it um in the first instance so so if i could summarize it it's kind of really sharpening those listening skills and the understanding of the, the wider category context and then making sure that the delivery and the follow through is kind of absolutely on point you know not, not kind of letting it slide and uh, making sure there's consistency across the, the delivery yeah yeah um Exactly. What, what what are some of the kind of current trends that you can share in the morning spreads category at the moment, or, or just peanut butter itself? You know that would be interesting for for listeners to kind of understand. Um. So the spreads category or peanut butter, I guess, used to be quite a stale traditional category, um, and then protein became a really big thing. Still is, but protein sort of had yeah like a really big uh, spike, and people recognised that you know natural or unsaturated fats aren't actually bad for you and so peanut butter had a real you know spike again it got really mm. popular again because of that but the category was still full of i guess lots of additives it wasn't very natural um and then genuinely i think i, th- I think pip then genuinely pioneered the category into what it is today and produced kind of a very healthy sustainable natural nut butter so it's still really really popular because people can now go to the category for protein benefits um energy and also it can be natural and sustainable. Um, and the category is way more focused around those those brands now. So there, I think there's a stat that is the brands without palm oil in them are growing 25%, whereas yeah. the brands with palm oil in them are growing only 2%. So there is a real swing towards the brands that are more sustainable and more natural. And um, there's also sugar is also a trend or... Yeah, or not a trend, should I say, but a trend that is not just obviously in the spreads category, but elsewhere. But definitely we're seeing people moving away from those products that are more, that are full of sugar into more natural, um, less sweet products. So yeah, we, and we definitely slot into that space. Um, Obviously peanut butter or morning spreads as a category has had a really good time over the pandemic. So everyone working from home, lots more people eating breakfast at home, which means that any breakfast product is way more popular so we've had a like covid was really positive for the category um and we're still seeing even though we're coming out the back of that now we're still seeing some pretty good growth because i think mm. as as penetration is growing in the category more people have come in over lockdown and, and are remaining um and also even though breakfast is the primary consumption occasion for spreads so most people eat peanut butter on a slice of toast there's definitely way more and consumption occasions now so people like, like snacks cooking for me, with it always. And, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah same i mean there's so many ways you can eat it now i literally just have it straight up with a spoon but there is definitely like lots more usage occasions so people are cooking with it you can make curries with it you can make obviously smoothies there's just so many things you can do with with peanut butter or almond butter now that um yeah there's uh, there's more opportunities to consume and there's more penetration so it's as a category it's doing really really well yeah, yeah. No, that's a good. That's a good. Have you um just a random tangent from me? Have you tried the uh, the Ritz crackers with with uh, like a good peanut butter? Because I no, honestly I think they are like they're the bomb. Get 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 oh, wow. on a Ritz cracker. It's just unbelievable. As a naughty oh, evening snack, really they're not even that naughty. It's just a great <laughs> evening snack. That'll that'll yeah, I'll sort the munchies out for you. Um, that sounds really good. Anyway, that's just me sharing an insight to how good I am <laughs> on an evening. Um, so no, thanks for that insight. That's really interesting. Um, well, you, you kind of touched on it um, and about you know Pip leading the way in, in the category. But what does Pip and Nut do differently um, as a brand as much as a product? And kind of where does sort of Pip and Nut sit as a brand context? Like who's it? Who's it sort of talking to? Um, so I guess. Um, without turning this into like a sales pitch I suppose the role of Pippa Nut is we're trying to fulfill the role of the most sustainable natural nut butter in the category yeah. without com- ever ever compromising on taste so we put uh we're a B Corp and we put sort of um people and planet ahead of profit and in every decision we make we genuinely consider the impact that that will have on the environment and the people in the community so um it's not just something that we that is outward facing that we say we do we it's genuinely something that we live and breathe and in every kind of 
aspect of the business, we take our position as a B Corp really seriously. So we are truly, truly t- trying to become the most sustainable nut butter in the category. Um, yeah, we never use any palm oil. We've mapped out our carbon footprint and we're on um, our way to sort of sourcing our ingredients in the most sustainable way we possibly can. Um, and we've recently moved all of our jars into glass. So that has been a long time coming and a huge, huge, huge project. But obviously improving the recyclability of our products is really important yeah. and was important to all of our consumers. So that's something that we listened to and we did we did last year. And then, so I guess that's, that's like the sustainable side of things. And then in terms of the never compromising on taste, we, yeah, are, it takes us a kind of a long time to, you'd think, to develop a product, which is another peanut butter or another nut butter, but it's because we are so hot on what a product tastes like and making sure that it is the perfect, most delicious version of the product it can be. So we go through hundreds of iterations of recipes and roasting levels of nuts and the size of the nuts in the peanut butter, everything gets kind of worked on to make sure that it truly is the best tasting. Um, We've won great taste awards for nearly every single one of our products. Um, um, Yeah, we're just constantly, constantly innovating. So we've got, uh, you might have noticed our limited editions, which are sort of a rotating skew that we have um, every six to nine months. We rotate that skew and have a new one. And it's just a way of keeping the category alive and relevant. Mm. Um, So yeah, I'd say, I mean, nut butter is, (laughs) there's only so much you can do with nut butter, but I'd say our role is definitely to be the most sustainable and to be the most the best tasting and, ne- and never compromise on either of those which yeah hopefully we do okay no that, that's really that. interesting I, I've, well i've got some of the products that you sent me as a sample so i just want to get them out for those oh, yeah. that are watching this rather than just listening to it so <laughs> gonna, uh, let me move the snacks in a minute so I've got the almond butters here so mm-hmm. there's smooth classic roast for those that are watching yeah and that's the uh, <laughs> like the gold isn't there and then there's um the arm butter and that's this is the cherry bakewell one so this is the one that i'm most excited to try I'm, yeah I, i'm obsessed with cherry bakewell so is this one of the limited edition ones or yeah that is so that yeah. was um we did cherry bakewell limited edition probably oh, i'm testing me now i did like a, a few years ago and then our recent limited edition um we did a, a bring back so we got our oh. our um consumers to vote for their favorite and that was the one that came out on top so it's a, a bring back skew so we had a big campaign around oh, that and got lots of fans involved but yeah it's it's delicious i mean it's got like real cherries in it it's yeah you could probably finish off the whole the whole jar it's like don't, it's don't, like a don't tell me. I, I won't yeah i'll get told <laughs> by the rest of the office for hogging it all um, <laughs> and there's yeah coconut almond butter as well which looks brilliant mm-hmm. like i can see that going down really well in a smoothie actually with a bit of kiwi yeah. and bananas tropical vibe yeah. um and then <laughs> There's on the peanuts, on the co- and this is the core range, isn't it? The peanuts, yeah. Yeah. So smooth and crunchy peanut is core. Yeah. And then that's you can see there if you're watching, guys. Two stars from, from great taste, which is great to see. <laughs> um, and then that's yeah, ultimate smooth dark roast, isn't it? This one. So that's the dark roast one. Yeah. yeah. So that's our new peanut butter launched last year um and it's just been the nuts have been roasted for a bit longer the the nibs in it are bigger so it's just for the ultimate peanut butter lover but i, I have to say um me and harry are a bit obsessed with peanut butter and when the samples came <laughs> we couldn't restrain ourselves so we've already tried that one and it guys it <laughs> is really really good um it is it's it's just in the snack cupboard so we're just going to spoon mm. it out of the jar <laughs> it's so good isn't it yeah and then this is the crunchy one isn't it the red yeah and again that's yeah. what two two stars so then see so that's there they're, they're obviously the nut butters and then there's um these these cups as well which look fantastic and straight away you can see guys no, no palm oil on the, the pack display which for me as a parent it's like really important trying to educate the kids on mm-hmm. sustainability and we just try and avoid anything that's like packed full of like unnecessary sugar and palm oil that's not yeah. to say I'm, I'm opposed to mm-hmm. you know sugary treats every now and again but they look they look, look brilliant see there's obviously dark chocolate uh, there's milk chocolate and then dark chocolate almond like go on if, if you had to pick one of these which one would you pick charlie which one's the winner uh dark top peanut for me i just peanut. love the yeah. taste of peanut and chocolate together um yeah. and then yeah the dark is just it's delicious and they're vegan so it's yeah. really good that's no no oh, i can't yeah so we are uh, doing some sofa snacks on this after this uh, podcast mm-hmm. running up so very excited to get stuck into them but just just finally to round it off um i mean you, you've given so many insights which i know you know those listening will appreciate but 
what qualities you think it takes um, to be successful in sales. I'm, I'm more, more thinking about those like character qualities that you mentioned earlier, like you know resilience. Just take me through what mm. you think is like really key. If, if people need to work on their, their character as well as their skill set, like what do you think they need to hone in in terms of character qualities to be successful in your world? Um, I think the most important thing for success in in a sales role is being comfortable and good at relationship building. Um, my mum always said to me when I was going through my interviews for grad schemes and stuff, she always said that people buy people first. And mm. that really stuck with me. And I, I probably think about that every single day and just being able to build a good relationship with your buyer or not just your buyer, but your network at the retailer. So, you know, outside of the buying, but in supply chain, in the category teams in trade planning, um, just building that relationship with people is, is really key because yeah, if, if if you get on with someone and someone gets on with you, you'll you'll have an, more enjoyable meetings with them. They're more likely to pull favors for you. Um, you'll you'll spring to mind when opportunities come up. Um, so yeah, I think it's that is that's probably the big thing I would say. But also not just building your relationship externally, but building it internally as well. So if you get to know how everyone else in your team and the wider team and understanding how your role fits into that bigger picture it will just help have those conversations externally and internally so you know for example if a buyer was to ask you what if you can do a promotion next week and they need x amount of stock you, you just know who to speak to and whether you've got you know whether that's something like yeah. that is achievable um so yeah i also think like so yeah relationship building is probably is number one i also think as you said, was it being resilient is really key and being a keen problem solver because it's not always going to go to plan. Nine times out of 10, it doesn't go to plan. So just making sure that you're able to think on your feet when you're in the middle of a negotiation, in the middle of a meeting with a buyer or be relatively unfazed when you get an email that is bad news or not something that you necessarily were expecting um, and be able to sort of bounce back from those from those hiccups and mm -hmm look at the solutions to something instead of the problems and recognize the failures in something as just as opportunities to learn um especially in light of kind of the, the pace of things in an sme you yeah you just need to be expectant of those and be prepared to bounce back from things when they when they go, don't go to plan yeah 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 bounce back ability that's the thing that yeah. talked about actually <laughs> this is, is what did, i just really knows that what does your mom do is she got background in sales sounds like she's a very wise lady <laughs> No, she's just, she's not got a background in sales, but she just is, yeah, she's she's very wise. Cool, <laughs> love that. All about the wise mums. Big up to the wise mums watching and listening. Um, yeah, hi mum. <laughs> um, uh, just, just in terms of like, I'm just thinking, so I speak to a lot of buyers that are keen to get into the supplier side and is mm. a difficult move to make, but lots of really, really good um, individuals in the supply base have got a buying background. So yeah. what advice have you got to anybody thinking about that move in terms of making sure that they land it and, you know, um, make sure they kind of understand the world of, of those that they're interviewing with? Um, I would say, well, I'd say nothing ventured, nothing gained. I definitely think it's a wise move. Um, I've definitely found it really beneficial and I've really enjoyed it. Um, I think the first thing is be really clear on whether it's blue chip or SME that you want, because mm. both can give you very different Great things. Advice. So if you're, you know, if you're up for a challenge and you want to get to know every function of a business and you want to join a business at the infancy and really kind of grow with it and, you know, ring the metaphorical bell when something when something lands like if you're up for that kind of pace then i'd say join an sme because it's really really brilliant um and you'll learn more in doing all of those things but if you want more structure you want more access to good training programs access to a broader business that maybe works across a bigger category or more categories um then i would join join the blue chip join you know one of the big firms it's i think be really clear on what it is that you want to get out of the move. Um, and then, yeah, I think if you do decide you want to go to an SME, my advice is to just make sure it's an SME that you really do believe in. Um, mm. I think working for a company like, like this, where you have to muck in, you've, it's hard work. You want to be make, you want to make sure that you're motivated by something. So yeah, I'd say make sure that you do your research on the brand, it, make sure it's something that you can get behind, make sure you align in the values, because not only will you find it more motivating and exciting, but you will also 
do better at the role because that integrity is so transparent when you have meetings with buyers. And I think also the recruitment process, the SMEs and the people recruiting you, they want to recruit people that have the same energy as they do about their brand. So I think, because you'll often be recruited by the founder in most cases. So just make sure that you do genuinely believe in what they're doing. I'd say that's, yeah, pretty key. That's, that's, good. No, that's, that's great, great advice. And then just finally, are there any resources or books, uh, podcasts that you direct people to that have been kind of good for your personal development that you sort of buy into? I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts that have had, that have guests on that are entrepreneurs or people that yeah. have, that, you know, run their own business. So uh, Diary of a CEO by Stephen Bartlett. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a long old podcast, but they have, he does have some brilliant, brilliant guests on there. So I, I really enjoy those. Um, Mary Porters also has another podcast called The Kindness Economy, which oh, yeah, where yeah. she kind of has guests on from more sort of purpose-led, sustainable brands, which I find really interesting to learn from those that are in a very similar sort of value space to Pippin Nut. Um, there's also a podcast called Create Tomorrow by WGSN, which is a trends podcast. Oh, and they're only sort of 25, 30 minutes long, but they're really good snippets into different industries and you can, yeah. you know, learning about the trends in tech or fashion or things that are cool. outside of the scope of FMCG are really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, that's, that's to WGSN those. you say? Yeah. WGSN. Nice. They do have um, blogs and things like that as well. And they're, they're, it's quite a cool like, yeah. trend forecast there. Um, and then I guess other than that, I suppose I've recently done quite a, a good course on resilience um so i'm in like in, in the way of sort of improving my resilience and yeah. doing things like gratitude journals and practicing mindfulness and things oh, like that because ultimately the role of sales is you have to be very very resilient because it's not always going to go to plan so i think practicing that um yeah really really helps so i'd recommend that as well it's not strictly a resource but no, do you know, I, I, it's one of the things that I did with, uh, with my Christmas money from my mum. I bought a journaling <laughs> course, which I did, and it's been really good, actually. I hadn't yeah. realised just how much stuff that you that you miss unless you write it down and go back and reflect on it. Um, but yeah. yeah, that was something that was suggested to me on a podcast that we did last year. And I remember thinking, I need to look into that. So yeah, if you're listening, mm. guys, go and do a journaling course. Really, really <laughs> right um, and, and listen to your mum. Clearly, that's another you know thing that's come through on this podcast is you need to listen to your mum, guys. <laughs> <laughs> definitely always listen to your mom and do a gratitude journal yeah, yeah. and eat peanut butter and yeah eat... three pieces of advice but not just any peanut butter pip and nut let's be, nut. Let's, you know let, let's let's be uh, specific um <laughs> just on that note where can people find you because obviously hopefully people are going to listen to this and um a reach out and say thank you to charlie because you know we appreciate her time but also go and, go and try the product go and be part of the pip and nut story yeah so we're um pretty much every major retailer so you'll find us in tesco sainsbury's uh asda morrison's you'll find us all over ricardo holland and barrett selfridges whole foods boots wh smiths like yeah we're we're in most places lots of independents um and yeah follow us on instagram we've got a great instagram we've got loads of loyal followers and we post some pretty cool com- content out there so yeah Rush come in. find us that's great well, look, Charlie thank you so much for being on the show we've really really appreciated it I know our listeners will do as well and uh, yeah all the best and I'll be following the story uh, whilst eating my, my peanut butter watching, watching what's going on <laughs> on the gram but yeah great. thanks so much guys for listening and uh, you know do reach out to Charlie and say thank you and we'll, uh, we'll see you all soon take care thank you so much Thanks for watching the video guys, check out the playlist here for more content like this, click the donuts to subscribe so you never miss an update, and give us a like and a comment so we know what content you'd like to see from us. See you next time.